The session I've been asked to talk about is, is my own research area, really, which is uh, the issue of kindness in leadership. Uh, actually, my own research area is why kindness in leadership doesn't work, rather than the study of kindness in leadership per se. I'm interested in why, why people don't engage in compassionate management. So I've been doing this for about seven or eight years now. Um, by background, academically, I'm a psychologist. Clinically, uh, I run clinics in eating disorders. And I still, even though I'm vice chancellor, I still have a clinic, free by the way, I've never charged, on differential diagnosis, but really around military services now. Um, my background in eating disorders was clinical. The research was clinical. So the further up the management tree I went in academia, the more difficult it became. I think lots of us in this room will recognize that. Uh, and so I just decided to transfer some of the principles of those research into my own job, really. So I got really quite preoccupied with why people are not very nice to each other, uh, particularly in work. So like a good academic, I went and looked at different leadership models. Um, forgive me if anybody's from business or management here, but there is a, a paucity of evidence for leadership models. But there's lots of them. There's about 30. Uh, the very common ones you'll know about, uh, heroic and post-heroic, very common before the 2008 crash. Funny enough, not so common now. Um, study was done at Harvard Business Schools on firms that survived the banking crisis, 2008 to 2010. Uh, they looked at them in 2012. And interestingly, this was in America, the firms that survived the banking crisis and continued to trade had three things in common. The first is they were the firms that didn't cut their R&D. They kept their research, they kept their innovation going. The second is they didn't cut their marketing budget, so the world still knew they were there. Thirdly, none of them had charismatic leaders. They had modest, decent, core business orientated leaders. The, all the heroic leaders had been washed away with the banking crisis. Uh, there's the steward model, um, good Scottish model. Um, I like the steward model. The steward model looks at leaders looking after institutions for the next generation. And so the goal is always to make the institution better in your terms of office before the next person takes over. A servant leader, which is very common now, a servant leader is very common in public services. We're here for the greater good, we serve others. Autocrat and Democrat has been around 100 years. Uh, Laissez-faire, old hat, but still there. Magnetic leaders, very common in Scandinavian countries. Uh, magnetic leaders, are those leaders that attract good staff. There is a, a, a paradox to that because there's a thing called non-magnetic leaders. Imagine coming to work and being called the non-magnetic leader. Basically means nobody wants to work with you. But the magnetic leader is supposed to attract staff purely for being who they are. So there's a touch of heroic charisma about it. Uh, sustainable leaders, that's a very interesting model. That's about wellness and well-being really and how fit and how long somebody can tolerate periods of uncertainty. And it seems to be national traits rather than individual, which I might talk about. Um, and sustainable is closely related to the newest model, which is the resilient model, which is how long an organization can survive under its present leadership in periods of uncertainty. It's a complexity model, really. And then we've got hierarchical, command and control, very common in blue lights. Uh, translational, uh, which is a d almost like a distributive model where leadership is pushed around the whole organization. It's very common in group structures. So I dug all these out and said, well, where's the evidence? And the thing that came very clear, if you're interested in management and leadership, is that many of the studies are done with and to management and leaders. And very, very few management and leaders will sit there and go, do you know what? I'm not very good at my job what they tend to do is go, oh, you've come to see me because I run a very successful company, uh, and therefore it must be me, and therefore you're gonna look at the characteristics. Then you'll go to another successful company and see if they shared characteristics, and eventually these models are developed. But there's very, very poor evidence. 
You know, you can look at big IBM square computers, all gone. Blackberry, do you remember those phones? Went in a night. Nokia, bomb-proof, great phones, struggle. So you can't take a firm. ICI, big, massive firm a few years ago. So you, c you can only take the snapshot of how successful the leaders are at that particular time. And very often when they go in other areas, they fail. Um, I was asked to provide some advice last week to a, a large organization, which w the whole business is education. And they've spent three years just declining. They're deeply, deeply in the poo now. Um, their chief exec is a shoe retail salesperson. So I said to the board, why, why did you appoint a shoe retail salesperson to run an educational establishment? Because we thought they'd be good at business. And, they, and it was a successful character they appointed. Didn't know anything about education. So you can't transfer leadership onto fields. And it's contextualized. You know, if any of us in this floor here now fell down with an arterial bleed, you want a command and control person around you. You do not want anybody to hold your hand to have a discussion about how you feel. You know, you want somebody to just throw. But those people, one of my friends, it's anecdotal, is a hip surgeon. He does 350 uh, hip replacements a year. Good surgeon. Um, but he's very bossy in the theatre. But he's good. Uh, when he goes home, he's not bossy. And he's, uh, he's into um, theatre and amateur dramatics. So when he goes and does the plays, he always gets minor parts, bit parts, but he's happy for the script writer, the director, the producer, the lights, etc., to tell him what to do. But put him in, in, a, in an operating theater and he tells everybody else what to do. So it's interesting how leadership can be contextualized, which is why we get this awkwardness, I think, when people meet their managers in different settings and they don't quite know how to talk to them. So I looked at all this, found the evidence was pretty strange, uh, and then decided to look at universities, uh, which are fantastic. I, I have a side hobby, which is the theater of the absurd. And you don't have to study the theater of the absurd. Just come and work in a university. So they do surveys on how you get on with your manager. Uh, and they never work in universities, because they say to academic staff, who's your manager? And they go, well, I'm a research assistant, so it must be the lab manager. On the other hand, it could be the professor, because they got the grant. Uh, on the other hand, I think I'm in a school, so it could be the head of department. Uh, but I'm not sure if I'm in the school, but I'm definitely in a faculty, so it's the dean. It's the dean. Uh, I think, because sometimes I have to work with other faculties. Uh, so it could be the finance manager. I don't know. Uh, and that makes it very difficult to find out what does a constructive leadership model look like in, in universities. We are at best a village. That's the way I look at it. So I started to look at what sort of models would fit best in a university setting. And I know some of you in the audience have got expertise in this area and expertise in philosophy, politics, etc., theology. So forgive me, I'm, I'm going to be quite general. But what I wanted to look at was whether there was an ethical reason to be a manager of a university. The reason I ask that is because there's been a trend in the last 20 years to have non-academic leaders in universities. And this sort of trend for university managers to copy business. If it works in business, then it must work in a university. But nobody ever goes to a business and go, do you think you can manage an institution like a university? And we're very strange. We're part public sector, because we get government grants, um, but we're also part commercial and part independent, because we have the freedom of, of speech under the 92 Act, and we can trade. Uh, but we're also a charity. We're registered with the Charity Commission. So we're public sector, we're a charity, and we're a business. And that makes it a very strange world. Um, and a lot of business people would struggle with that. Now, I ought to be fair to you all before I start by saying that one of my friends is a very successful business person. He owns his own plane, very wealthy. And he said to me a few months ago, you know what, Mike, you're very naive 
And I said, what do you mean naive? He said, this model of kindness that you're pursuing won't work. And I said, why won't it work? He said, I'm a really successful businessman. I make loads of money because I just chomp everybody up and everybody else chomps everybody else up. And I said, there's no evidence for that. There's no evidence for it. It's just your opinion. So we'll just have to agree to differ. And he said, you wouldn't survive in business. And I said, you don't know what a university is. And universities have survived in Britain longer than most businesses. There aren't many big, large businesses in Britain that have survived as long as universities or molded themselves into different institutions as time's gone on. And I, I found that fascinating. But it gave me an insight into why some people don't like the model of grace or kindness. So I looked at Aristotle, interesting. Schiller, Frederick Schiller is one of my favorite, father of pragmatism, Stuart Mills, Kant, uh, Collinson, more modern, Searle, etc. Uh, and what they led me towards, really, was this idea of what's now called a virtuous leader. It's not my idea, it's Cameron's uh, 2011, if you're interested. The virtuous leader tries to say, OK, if you practice management and leadership, what are the ethics, what are the principles, rather than the behaviors? And the principles that apply are things like integrity. We know there are studies that show that they're called greasy polars. People can reach the top of any profession uh, if they change their colors as they go along. Greasy polars is the term that we use. Uh, it means that uh, somebody will support the present government. You can recognize this in the reality of university worlds at the moment. We're under intense pressure to be compliant. You know, to, to, to take part in the TEF, you have to be registered with the OFS. To be registered with the OFS, you have to agree to take part in the TEF. So it's a compliant model. Um, and then we've got the KEF and the REF and this HEFKI. So all these acronyms which can confuse us. But basically, they're all statutory bodies and regulatory bodies. The government is mad keen to make universities compliant. Now, there's a logical reason for, for that. About 17% of kids went to university in the early 70s. It's just under 50% now. It's fantastic, brilliant. Just under 50%. We want it to go up to 70, perhaps even 80% of all young people. So the government should have a right to say, well, hang on, that's a big population group. We ought to have a say here. But that is different to controlling. And the issue with compliance is that if we comply with this government, if we were greasy polars and went, oh, we'll have a quiet life, we'll just comply with this government, when another government comes in, they'll go, well, you complied with that lot, you can comply with this lot and there'll be a different change of policies. Then another government will come in, and eventually there will be no virtuous worth in a university. There will just be tools for social engineering. And so we, we reject that in the university sector. We, we hide ourselves in the 92 Act where we have the right for freedom of speech. But it's about integrity, really. I always think, if you work in a university, it's a personal view, that it's like a vocation. You choose to work here. You don't have to work here. I don't have to work here. But what do you engage with when you do work here? And you only engage really with two things. One is intellectual knowledge and one is people. Everything else just supports those two engagement. So it must be a vocation of some sort. Everybody must like working with people or with ideas. So you have to have a sense of integrity with that. Well, you don't have to. You can actually poo on your neighbor and make your way up. Um, and evidence does show that greasy polars do make it to the top uh, and then shut the hatch behind them, particularly women leaders. Uh, and that's, I'll come back to that, which is a shame. Uh, authenticity is another one. How can you be authentic? All of us in this room would have gone to meetings and have to role play. Here's a disciplinary, I'm defending someone, or I'm acting as the prosecutor. Here's a new idea, here's a cut, here's some money, here's a growth, here's pressure. And, and we role play in those rooms. But how do you be authentic in that? And you, to be authentic, you have to be consistent. You can role play once, but if you pretend to be kind or pretend to be nice, people will see through it. 
after a while consistency is the clue that's why if any of you are engaged in relationships and relationship therapy you will know that the hardest thing in relationships is the rebuilding of trust when trust is broken I worked for Relate for 13 months I only got given divorce cases because I was mental health they just went oh you can deal with the divorce because your mental health are where you go and it was mainly around the breakdown of trust it's harder to rebuild trust than to walk away from it it's easy to walk away it's hard to sit there and go now you have to repeat trusting authentic integrity behavior time and time again maybe for two years maybe ten years but there's always the risk at some point in your life somebody will go yeah but I once received an email going, I've shared an office with this person for 10 years and I can't stand them. <laughs> and the other person never knew. So you've got to be authentic, but you can hide it, but you have to be. And it has to have worth. It has to have a price. You know, we get, if we give our lives to ideas, if you fall in love with subjects, which I believe academics do or most do, if you fall in love with an institution, or you fall in love with the relationship that we have with other people, then it has to have some worth, some price that we're, worth, that we're willing to pay, a cost to ourselves, really. For me, it's time. Time is the currency. How much time can we give to people? You must, all of you in this room must have thought, oh, I'm really busy, and somebody's gone, have you got a minute? And it's never a minute. It's usually about half an hour, but you have to do that. And it has a cost. So that's why I started looking at leadership. I was interested in grace, very difficult concept, 19th century concept, really. Grace is defined as doing good to oneself and also to society at large. I like that. I thought, right, I'll go and look for graceful leaders. I haven't found any, by the way. Um, found some close ones, um, Mandela, um, Gandhi, King in America, Obama is a probably a modern day one, very graceful, academic, ex-professor, um, which is interesting. Um, Trump, no, <laughs> perhaps not. Uh, Theresa May, no, she lacks grace. You know, so it, it, I got interested in this idea of, well, what does, what does doing, doing good to yourself is easy, it's just well-being. You're a fool if you try and go into management and leadership and don't look after yourself. If you don't exercise, sleep, eat properly, then, then you're really letting your organization down. That includes mental and f uh, emotional health as well. But the in other bits I got really interested in. What, what does it mean doing good for others? What, 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 doing good for others, that's a really interesting concept. Doing good for society. And that's when I started thinking, well, Maybe what we can do is look at whether managers and leaders in universities could apply that as a, as a value, really, a virtue or a principle, whichever way you want to look at it. It's quite anti-Kantian. Immanuel Kant has really swayed uh, the way business, particularly business, probably Stuart Mills as well, but that, that idea of do something and don't worry about the consequences that the action itself can sometimes justify the means, um, and perhaps the end justifies the means. Uh, Schiller re absolutely rejected that. He just said that's just a con trick. That's just a way of fooling yourself to do bad things on the basis that good things happen in the end. Uh, and it allows people to compete. Kant said dignity uh, and moral intellect gives you a better moral life. And uh, Schiller just used to laugh at him Schiller was a p playwright. He said, well, where's your emotions? You, know, you, you can't just use your intellect. Here's, here's one that uh, Nietzsche came up with. If you get up in the morning, do you think I am in a good mood and therefore you think good things? Or do you get up and you feel you're in a good mood and then you think good things? That's what Schiller talked about. It's virtually impossible, except in a crisis command and control situation, to think about decisions and consequences without emotions. So I then started looking at 
why kindness doesn't work, what stops it. And uh, it's interesting, the literature. Um, senior managers in most organizations like to reproduce themselves. They like to clone. So if you work in a macho, hierarchical, compound and control, um, fear-based organization, you will want to promote people who exhibit, exhibit those characteristics. If you work in a different sort of organization, charities, voluntary organizations, then you'll want to bring in leadership that, in effect, reflect your own values. If you're interested, uh, volunteer organizations have higher productivity than most commercial organizations. The nearest that come to it is small, organic, media-type companies where everybody joins in in mad, fun-type projects. But it's interesting. I, I looked at volunteers for quite a long time, actually. Uh, they seem to share the sense of togetherness and value and end point, whether that's an allotment or large charities, San Frontier, etc. There's that sense of thinking they're doing something different, making a different. Uh, whereas where you get uh, into industry, you get alienation. Uh, it can be shown like this. Um, the difficulty the university's got with the Institute of Technology and technology education is because most middle class families will sit there and go, that's for the other. My children go to university. If they don't go to university, they go and do a technical education. It's just part of our British psyche since the Second World War. There's no evidence for that thinking, but it's a narrative that's got hold of that. So people go, get up, they go to work, they get the money, they pay the mortgages, they don't engage with the work, they don't engage with the leadership, they don't engage with the mission. It, sometimes they work in damp conditions, cold conditions, horrible conditions, they work outside, they work long hours, and then people sit there and go, do you know what, they're miserable ass staff. You think, yeah, I wonder why. So leaders like to promote their own values. And so in macho organizations, you tend to have repetitive macho leaders. In fact, you get the repetitive mistakes. Um, and they will argue, quite rightly, they will argue, well, if they're macho leaders, I use that term macho to mean hierarchical, command and control, autoc autocratic leaders, uh, with a sense of just do as you're told, uh, they're right. Productivity is higher than organizations that are more engaging with staff and kinder. Uh, productivity is higher and profits are higher, but only for three years. After three years, organizations that have more inclusion of staff and more compassion in their managers have the same level of productivity, uh, but they spend less on new staff. It's called the battery model. You bring in staff, you burn them out, throw them out, bring in new staff, burn them out, throw them out. It's very common in some areas of industry, s some countries in the world like that. And so it's difficult if you believe in a compassionate kindness type of manager to sit there in an organization that takes the values of the 2008 crash, for instance, where you got rewarded for making loads of money, you got rewarded for shafting colleagues, you got rewarded for getting bigger profits. That was the thing. Um, it's very hard to sit there and go, do you know what, do you think we should include people in decision making? Um, do you think we should engage more in shared values? Do you think we should have a shared mission? They would just ask you to leave. And so those areas keep developing. If you're interested, the difference between the salary of a chief exec in those sort of companies in America and their staff is 226%. The highest paid person gets 70 million sterling pounds a year. 70 million. If you're interested, they also get massive, massive government subsidy from the United States government, but it isn't. It's a big, self-reliant, independent company. But it's interesting. So there is this gradual erosion of staff terms and conditions as the leaders uh, really fatten up the cake. But the alternative means we do catch up. We, do, we can change it. 
it's very difficult the other is women women leaders um, it's it's stereotypical it's sexist it's gendered it's very very hard for women in a hierarchical command and control organization to be themselves um, Karen Brady summed it up when she worked at Birmingham City Football Club she has to work twice as hard as the men to be considered half as good so working late not putting your family first um, sticking up for yourself uh, not crying um, which is seen as a mental health issue in men but a woman thing with women leaders which is ridiculous um, being extra hard on staff twice as tough uh, and then get to the top yet all the studies show particularly in the FT200 that those boards that have women leaders in who reject those have better profits than all male boards nobody knows why and those chief exec, those women chief execs that have adopted kindness models make more profits than their competitors. But nobody knows why. Which is interesting. It's called the feminization of leadership. Um, I think it's just because uh, women have higher spatial awareness than men. And they probably get, it's called multiple cognitive processing. Uh, it's nothing to do with biology. It's just the way that children are brought up really but I think a lot of women particularly very bright sharp women can think and see and feel several things at the same time multiple cognitive processing when men get it we call it deja vu <laughs> so it's hard it's hard for women um, Thatcher was probably the worst model she definitely shut the hatch behind her decided that she would be a man in the terms of her leadership skills and didn't open the door for other women whereas other women have done that so it's hard for, to be a woman it's hard to work in a, in a macho environment it's hard if you want to be a leader and be different there's this herd mentality the other thing that makes it different I think is this power structure that we have in management I, I say this, some of you in the room may have heard me say this. When I'm in a room and in a meeting, I tend to think we're all equal. Um, but I know that it's not true, really, because people sit there going, yeah, you're the vice chancellor. But I wish it was. I wish it was. When, when I do my research, I do it outside the university because it's, I can talk to colleagues who are professors, readers, senior lecturers, heads of, in other universities because I'm just part of the research team. Whereas if you get this, this system here, wherever you work, it's twice as hard to engage with colleagues if you're in leadership. Which is interesting, I think. Um, it's hard to get out a role and be different in different settings because people put you in that role. People expect you to be in that role. Uh, and if you go out a role, people get very nervous and try to be yourself in every situation besides is a sign of mental illness uh, according to Freud is very very difficult and I've found it a lot I've got colleagues who are senior leaders in universities who quite aptly do research with other universities but don't with their own and they say the same things I find and many of you in this room will find it's difficult to swap hats difficult for people to see you in a different role This led me to really start thinking seriously about what kindness meant, which is why we have the university values, really. Um, kindness, common sense. We call it compassion, but really it's kindness. Attention to detail, mainly because we've got regulatory things on. And trust, because it's hard to rebuild trust once it's broken. So I thought very carefully. The trust came through the work HR did with consultation with staff. But I really liked it. I thought really carefully about these. Trust, you know, the old word, trust. It's the roots, means treasure. It means most treasured personal belongings. T-R-Y-S-T, trust. A bond, something hidden and given to others when you really, really can feel confident that they will also respect what you've got, your treasure, 
or your emotions. And I like that. I like the idea that we can start to trust each other. Compassion seems very sensible to me. If you're dealing with people and you're dealing with knowledge, it seems very sensible to say, well, shouldn't we care for each other? And common sense is just Schiller's pragmatism, doing good for others. In practice, it means if you're dealing with a student appeal and you know they'll win the appeal, then you probably need to make the decision locally. Tiny things like that in our day-to-day -day lives. And um, teamwork, because we're a village, really. That's how I see it. We are really closed off from the rest of the world. We're not an ivory tower anymore. Those days are well gone. But we are special. We are special. There are things that a university do, can do that no other organization can do. We can act as a charity. We can act as a private company. We can act as a public sector company. We can be active in the community for its own sake, but we can also chase money so that we can get more money to get more resources. We don't have shareholders. We don't really need to make a profit. Everything has to be pumped back for our students and staff. Teamwork seems a very sensible approach for me. And attention to detail. Really, it's attentiveness. But attention to detail seemed very good because the organization was quite poor on, on detail when I came here three years ago. I meant our returns. And that, that's really where I came from. I read Aristotle and all the great philosophers. In the end, I read Tommy Smith's biography in his time with Shankly in Liverpool. And he said to Shankly in 1962, what makes a really, really good team? What makes a successful team? And Bill Shankly said, and he was, Bill Shankly was painting the toilets at that time, by the way, because he said, what's good for us is good, is good for the fans. I really like that. And he said, what makes a really good team? Well, we're, n we're not there yet, but when we do get there, and I'm not a Liverpool supporter, um, what you'll get is common sense, teamwork, and attention to detail. <coughs> I like that. Seems a good way to deal with an organization. So that's why we've been trying to push kindness through. It does increase productivity. There's more goodwill. People like working together. I like the idea of having fun. Fun, by the way, is a cognitive process for me. If you're having a laugh, if you're teasing each other, if there's goodwill around the team, uh, if the people are joking, that's a sign of multiple cognitive processing. If you start to avoid people, lock yourself in your office, start just working on tasks, start to really not like being around other people, it's usually the first signs of stress. But usually the loss of humor is the giveaway. That joke you tell, it just goes flat. And you think, oh, it's a bit stressful here. So I watch the senior team. Some of you are in this room now. I watch you closely. If you're teasing each other, I feel okay. If you're teasing me, I feel okay. If we tease each other and we're not okay, then I think something's going on. There's a bit of a stress. But how many of you do that? How many of you sit there in your team and think, what's the humor here? How do we get that going? Where's the sense of fun? The one thing I have learned before I come into questions about universities is really we're not that good at communicating with each other. We are very good at developing communications, but we're just not good. How many of you will email a colleague or get an email from a colleague in the next office yeah. or avoid using their phone or avoiding popping your head round. How many of us burn out with emails? How many of you know your colleagues working from home on a certain day because you get 90 emails in two hours? How many of you get copied in? How many of you, the most despairing for me is when 50 colleagues are copied in and somebody goes, I've changed the date from next Wednesday at 11 to next Wednesday at 10. Fine. And then somebody in the 50 goes, OK. <laughs> and then there's 50 trails. And then you find 10 of them are out of office. And they keep coming back with out of office. And then somebody goes, do you know Jane's out of office? And then you think, no, all this has started. And we're now having a nuclear war. 
We're just not very good. It's almost like we're afraid to talk. I know universities are competitive, particularly in academic life. You've got to publish, you've got to get your research grants in, you've got to get good feedback from students, you've got to recruit, you've got to keep, you've got to get graduate jobs, a thousand and one bureaucratic jobs to do, relationships to make, external links. If you're good at all that, you get promoted. It is competitive in that sense. So I get that, but communications, particularly electronics communication, I think can sometimes be inauthentic and sometimes bullying. You know, particularly if you're in management, you'll get staff who will send emails to more senior managers, but copy the manager in, but without telling the manager that they've said why, why they've been copied in. It's like a subtle threat, really, like an undercover exocet that's on its way to them, and we stereotype. You have to read emails out loud. You know, I, t I tend to do that, which is a, just a trait I've got. I tend to think of emails before I send them, particularly sensitive ones, and read them out loud. Because when you're in a hurry, you go, OK. Sometimes it's just a K. It just says K. And then 50 people are copied in, and they go, what does the K stand for? And anyway, that's. So I think about it and read it out loud, because I think sometimes when we read things, it gets stereotyped because we're in a hurry uh, and then we forget to say things like dear or many thanks or see you later and it's okay if we all get that but some people won't get that and some people get offended and then another spiral starts and that's what fascinates me how people have difficulty I've not met anybody in my working life who gets up in the morning and thinks whose day can I screw over today I, I haven't um, I'm sure they're about, but I'm, I've not met them. Or maybe I've met them, but they just haven't told me that they screwed my day over. I don't know. But I do meet people every day who just wind people up, who do things that I just find strange. I'll give you the example. In my last university, the vice chancellor's very busy. He's typing away. And somebody popped their heads in and went, vice chancellor, there's a problem in this area, but I've got, can I sort it out? And the VC went, yeah. And about two days later, about 10 people came to see the vice chancellor and went, why did you agree to restructuring and 10 people losing their jobs and us moving buildings and two programs closing? And he was like, what? <laughs> Where did that? And the person who did that knew that. So I introduced a, 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 a protocol where if you were with your senior leaders, you had to give them half a page with a line saying, this is a problem, these are the consequences, these are the solutions. It was like an informed consent. We were trying to say to senior leaders, don't make a decision until you've got at least as many of the facts as you can get. Uh, and people complained saying it slowed the process down. But I think people complained really because it stopped them to allow, stopped them playing those games. I'm going to end on three things. We need to sort out how we communicate together, all of us, I think, uh, all the time. We need to look after our health, physically, mentally, emotionally. Um, we need to look at how we manage time. Uh, we should be having fun. We should look back when we retire and go, that was a good time to work with colleagues, not a miserable time. Um, and we should be resilient in dealing with uncertainty. I was at Kiel last night. Uh, it's really interesting, a huge group of senior leaders. And it was like a council of despair. I, I don't think colleagues will mind me saying that. They had to make a list of everything that, were, that was worrying the sector. And the list just kept on growing and growing. And I was the sort of, when it came to me, I said, I, I, I think uncertainty is good. I think it's great that the government doesn't know what they're doing. God help us if they did. You know, it's great. The government don't know what they're doing. That gives us a chance to do things because they're not telling us what to do because they're not sure what to do. Uncertainty can be good for a short period of time. Think of that with your colleagues. You know, don't, don't put people under periods of uncertainty for a long period of time. It affects their health, then it affects their timekeeping, then it affects their communications. It goes round and round. So that's it really, that's an overview. I'm happy to answer questions. I know we've got to finish in 10 minutes, which is not a long time, but I'm happy to answer any questions on anything related to this.